celebration. Uh, my name is Gail Taylor. For those who do not know me, I'm the superintendent of schools here. And so we are very honored today to have some very special guests with us. So at this time, I'd like to introduce those special guests. Uh, so if you're here, we'll make you stand up. Just kind of give us a little wave. We have Miss Missy Wally from the Department of Ed. Uh, we have Senator John Milligan, who is on his way. He'll be here shortly. Uh, Mayor Eddie Dunnigan. Black Oak. Ex-teacher. Ex-teacher. That's, that's exactly right. We talked together here when I was here as a teacher. And we have Senator Dan Sullivan. Yay. Thank you all for being here. We're honored to have you. And of course, we have two other people we feel like that are part of our family now at this time after three years. We have Kim Bailey from Solution Tree and our coach, John Yost. <laughs> Get around, John, and give high fives to everybody. <laughs> you know, today is a, is a celebration. It's a celebration marking the end and the beginning for us at Buffalo Island Central. But for the past three years, we've been involved with Solution Tree and uh, trying to change the culture at Buffalo Island Central. My principals and my staff have been exposed over the past three years to some of the very best professional development that they'll ever be exposed to in their lives. Uh, PLC has been very meaningful to me. Uh, I kind of I have to tell you a little story. I was in education for about 30 years before I ever heard of Solution Tree. I was in my office over here. And I was trying to figure out what can we do at Buffalo Island to make this a better place. I got a brochure that came across my desk from Solution Tree talking about professional learning communities. Professional learning communities have been a part of school districts for quite some time. But I never was exposed. I kind of hit and missed it when it became important. I was either teaching or doing something else. So someone give us a try. So I went to St. Charles, Missouri. I went by myself. I didn't tell any of my administrators that I was going or anything like that. My <laughs> wife went with me. She stayed in the motel. I went to that conference some six, seven years ago, and I've never been to anything that was as powerful in my life as that. Now, as educators, we do a lot of things. We are required to do a lot of things. We go to a lot of staff development, and a lot of times we come out of that staff development scratching our heads and saying, why in this world did I have to do that? When I went to my training, at St. Charles, Missouri, with the PLC, I came back on fire. I was on fire the first time I heard the first speaker. And of course, I was, you know, I was privileged to hear the uh, the guru, Mr. Rick himself. Rick and his wife, Rick before, is the guru of PLC. When I left that day. I said, this is something that will work for my school district. I said, it's something so simple. Why have we not attached to this so many years ago? Why have we not done this? Because I, I, I'll admit, I've served in every capacity that you can serve as, as an administrator. I've been at the grade bottom. I've been a dean of students. I've been a junior high principal, a high school principal, an assistant superintendent. Been a transportation director. I've been it all. <laughs> and, you know, when we go in our classrooms and we see teachers teaching, sometimes as an administrator, we walk out feeling a little bit helpless because maybe I don't have that degree in math. Maybe I don't know how to tell that teacher how to become a better math teacher. I go into science. I go into foreign language. Well, this is a process that we work through. It's a process where we empower teachers to make other teachers better. 
it's a process that we open those doors and we throw away the key and say, come on in and help me become a better teacher. We empower teachers to empower other teachers. My wife thought I was some kind of nerd because when I came back to the motel, that's all I, I wanted to talk about. She's an educator, you know, just like I am for 40 years now. She says, what is going on? I said, you need to really come. She said, I, I said, I'll sneak you in. <laughs> said, no, I'm not going to do that. So we didn't do that. And so I came back on fire to my administration. And in my process, in my during that while well, I was sitting there, but one thing, and not one thing, but one of the things I got from the institution was this is not something that can be hammered down from the top to the bottom. So I had to figure out how in the world could I get my administration to buy into what I wanted them to do. And so we had never done a book study at BIC. And of course, this was my first or second year here. So we did a book study, and I'll, I'll test my people. What, were the, what was the book study on? So I don't you know. know. You've been <laughs> a book since then. No, <laughs> this is just my administration. Leaders of learning. learning. Yes. Leaders of learning. And what happened from that book study is we went through that process, and when they discovered this is what we need at Buffalo Wild and Central Oklahoma, they knew exactly because they believed in the same things that the book was teaching. They believed that we had to empower teachers. They believed that there's no way under this sun that our teachers can go and teach every standard out there and be an effective teacher. They believed that if we could empower teachers and those teachers could help other teachers, then we could be more successful. They believed that the most important thing in changing the results of education was to change our teachers. And we bought into it. And so I said, you got to go to the next conference. you got to go. And you can ask them. I've never said you have to do this as an administrator. You have to go to this conference. You have to go to this training. I don't do that because, again, as I prefaced earlier, there's so many things out there that are really a waste of time. But I said, we will go again as a team. I was going to go again with them. So they went the following year, and they came back, and they saw the same results. And so that's how Solution Tree came about at Buffalo Island Central. I think it was in cohort two year that we were going to apply at that time, we did not have our school buildings built, and so we operated with an elementary at Monette, elementary at Leechville, a junior high at Leechville, and a high school at Monette. And uh, this, I think, it may have been you. You see that you said you don't need to apply this year because you're not ready for that. There's too much separation. So when we got our new buildings, which was going to be the following year, we applied as a cohort three school. I beg the department, and Dr. Pfeffer to please grant us this. You know, for me, it was one of those things I felt like if, if we could become a PLC school, that's the way I'd want to go out as, as a superintendent. I'd want to end my tenure as an administrator, as administrator by our school being a PLC because I believe so strongly in it. We're not there yet. We've completed our three years. We've completed our three years. But we're not where I want to be yet, so I'm not retiring tomorrow. So anybody that hoped that I would do that, it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this three-year process, we talked about this uh, when we were granted when we were granted the, the grant. You know, one of the things that they tell you at the very beginning is, look, we're going to invest a lot in the school district, but at the same time, the school district is going to have to make their investment. Your teachers are going to be out of class an awful lot for training. And I looked at that and I thought about it because we all know that we need teachers in classrooms. But uh, I said, I'm looking at it as an investment. It's an investment for my kids at Buffalo Island, my teachers at Buffalo Island, and my administrator at Buffalo Island. One day I'm going to be gone. I want them to be able to have something to live on we can impact and empower teachers and kids from this day forward. 
Little did I know that we would take on a pandemic for three years. <laughs> Little did I know that. Okay? <laughs> Little did I know that that next year that we would not have on-site instruction with our students and our teachers. Little did I know that once we worked our way through and we got our kids back that I'd have so much teacher absenteeism because they were quarantined and couldn't be here. <laughs> Little did I know that just last year and the second year of our, uh, excuse me, this year, the third year of our cohort year, that we'd have a tornado that would come through and hit both the Monet community and the Leechville community that make up Buffalo Island Central Long Black Island. And oh, by the way, did I tell you, you had a superintendent that said, you know, we need to go from five days to four days. So that's a lot, a lot of <laughs> challenges. I didn't say excuses, because I'm not going to use that word excuse, because we've hashed it out behind closed doors that, you know, there's been a lot of things that have taken place, but we have to look at it from the, from the standpoint, those were challenges. We overcame those challenges. We're ready to move forward. You know, a lot of times the old farmers would say, you know, there's an old saying, something about the, the barns and the hay, you know, and they were kind of laid by. My teachers and my administrators now have been trained in the PLC process. Done a good job. Our solution tree has done a wonderful job in making sure that they get what they need. I hate to say it. Now it's up to us. It's up to us. What do we do with this from this day forward? Will determine the success of Buffalo Island Central. I know what's going to happen because I already see it. I, it's probably not what we would see in a, a typical normal three year period of time, but I see collaboration going on in our classroom. I see our teachers doing things that I never would have thought they would be doing at this particular point in time. And that's a testament to the wonderful faculty that I have. And the wonderful administrators I have. We're not perfect, but let me tell you, we're family here and we love each other. And now it's all up to us. So this time we'll turn it over to Miss Kim Baker. Let's go. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to keep my comments brief, but um, let me just share with you my role. Um, as lead associate for Cohort 3, I have the wonderful opportunity to see all of the schools that have partnered with ADE and Solution Tree to implement the professional learning communities. And I think Galen said it well, you go to these conferences and you hear about these things and you get on fire. Um, this project is intended to help schools become empowered and uh, equip themselves to do the right work. And you'll hear the journey today uh, that Buffalo Island has taken to, to do just that, to put legs on this vision of all kids learning at high levels. But there are certain practices that teens need to learn. And I, I want to just acknowledge the people in the back of the room. And I, I have this sign, you know, we have the sign up here that says Buffalo Island Dignitaries. And you guys are the dignitaries because you did the work, right? You are empowered to um, look at your students' learning, get clear on what they need to do. You use the data to reflect on your own practices and improve them. You did it in a collaborative fashion. Um, that's what this is all about. And it, it doesn't happen overnight. As a small school district, you had to learn certain strategies to get this going. And um, so I, I'm excited to hear your story and celebrate with you. Um, and I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Dr. John Ghost, major doctor. Maybe a doctor. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Coach. Coach. So I just wanted to reflect and uh, I want to share some personal stories uh, that's actually happened the last few days that have uh, almost inspired me, is probably the word I wanted to. So if you think back, 
year one was really about trying to create that foundation. I remember sitting with the guiding coalition and just asking, why do you come to work every day? What's, what's our purpose, right? And we talked about, are we here for all kids, some kids? Are we here to provide opportunities or to ensure the learning? We had to grapple with those issues. Remember those grapplings, Bruce? I remember those. Just grapple with those core issues. And then we started working with the teams and we really started with, what is it that we want all kids to know? Okay, are we clear on it? Is it vertically articulated? We just really spent a lot of time. And I was just tickled pink with how we got started. And then March hit, right? <laughs> got a little jolted, right? But something happened, okay, when that. I think that was an experience that really brought you together to say, we actually need each other. It's got to remember dealing with technology issues, right? How are we going to do this? And we were scrambling. And it wasn't Buffalo Island scrambling. It was our nation scrambling. What does education look like, right? But we persisted, right? So we got through that. And I'm, I was probably one of those, oh, this won't last long. We'll be back to normal, right? By the beginning of the year, we'll be back to normal. They gave it. It wasn't normal the next year, right? Yeah. But we started. We, we focused on learning. And that's really what we started thinking about, okay, it's not about teaching. The really question is, are kids learning? And we're going to start thinking about how do we monitor learning? What does that look like? Okay, Things are going well, but I think, especially the first half of the year, I think that's what it was like. Okay, Remember high school? Yeah. Things we were talking about. Okay, How do we keep kids from plagiarizing? They're not doing the work. Our failure rate is really high. How do we provide learning for a kinder student? They need to be with their teachers, right? And what does Fridays look like? Right? I'm going to grapple with all that. Okay. But guess what? Okay. We hung on, right? This wasn't the Sylvester Stallone and Cliffing. We hung on. We made it through, right? In year three, I think we finally, things started clicking. We just said, okay, how do we provide an extra time? And each of you did it differently. The four-day work week, and we started looking at that. What does that second that afternoon walk look like? And I'm, I'm looking at um, the elective teachers, and how do we enrich all kids, right? And how do we find kids that need support? How do we do that? We did a great job with that. And we were really trying to just change habits, get back into the rhythm. And I really capture year three is we got focused again. And we had the tornado, and I remember getting the call. Um, but even that didn't deter us from our, from our vision. So I want to share a few things that's happened in the last few days and over the last couple of months that probably give me the greatest hope for, for Buffalo Island. So we're, there's, there's Emily. So I talked with Emily and Sarah yesterday, and it really hit me. I asked them, how are you guys doing? And Emily goes to me, I'm excited about next year. And after these three years, She's excited. She's excited about her team next year. I was talking to Mark yesterday, and uh, Mark says, I'm really proud of our ELA team. We are, we are moving. We're making gains. Um, and Mark, it was really good to hear you say that yesterday. I was worried about you several times, right? <laughs> <laughs> he, has a, he has a plumbing license, right? And I think was, I was worried about him. just said, screw it. I'm going to be a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he hung in. And I, I think he you start to see the power of collaboration. I'm really proud of you. We right worry about it too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it was February where I was at the elementary school and Scott came in. I was working with Kim and Nicole and Scott came in talking about his thoughts around standards-based grading. When I first met Scott, I'm not sure I liked Scott. Okay. <laughs> Scott's That's opinion right is Scott. That's all right, we're, Scott. We're, we're, matter of fact, we're, we're more alike than we realize because he's opinionated. He's strong-willed. I think, we, I think we came to appreciate each other. And what I learned about Scott was it's all about kids. And so he's, he's constantly thinking about how do we get better. I'm excited about where you're going with the standards-based grading slide. I thank you for your service at that school, pushing that school. Um, talking with Kim and Nicole, uh, and how are we going to tweak RTI? Even though it's going well, they want to tweak it. They want to make it better. That's the, that's the passion. That's an ongoing, continuous improvement. Um, and Faith, you impressed me this morning. You walk in, and we start talking. and say, hey, Faith, how are you doing? You know what she said? All my kids are green. And 
That's what she was talking about. Right? I mean, that's what that's what we need. This is what it's about student learning. Okay. But my last slide is about the fierce and foursome. Okay, the Fantastic Four. I was going to go with fierce and foursome. But I went Fantastic Four. And I grew up watching this cartoon. I was I was the rock guy. I don't even know what his real name is. Um, but I want to I want to call out Randy, Mark, Kim, and Nicole. Um, it's tough to lead. It's tough to lead. Leading during this time is really hard. But you show perseverance, okay? Kept it going. You put up with my constant nudging. Um, I probably made you mad a few times. I know, Nicole, I made you mad a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Just me <laughs> down. Because I would push them, right? Mark, I know Mark was mad at me a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> the young ones got mad. They took it, they right? took it together. Um, that was my job. My job was to be a grain of sand, to ask a tough question, push me out of the comfort zone. Um, so thanks, thanks for putting up with me, for making me always feel welcome. Um, I'm going to miss seeing you guys. Um, you know, hopefully I'll get to come by and see you. I know we have one day in September, makeup day. Uh, we'll look forward to that. But um, the real heroes, to be honest, are all those in the back that are daily doing the work. Um, it's really great to see you guys um, bond together and help each other become more independent. And I think there's great things happening for both of us. So thank you for letting me serve. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Randy Rose. I'm going to leave the clicker up here so for the slides, like I know, like you, get, you just click forward through your slides. Okay? If you need help, I'll come up and help you. Give me the call, let, let it be known real quick which one of those four I was in that. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to think so I had two females and two males. I just, it didn't work. <laughs> well, uh, I have about three things, three topics to cover today. And mine are the practices that have changed in our school. And then a little bit about changes for students and then some aha moments for students. And so I'll just begin that on a, the... In our outline, the changes, there was a couple of branches you could take on that. One of them was a personal element. So for me, when I first met John, I said, I've all been complaining for 18 years that I don't have time to be the instructional leader. You remember that? Yep. All right. I wrote it down. Yeah. <laughs> because all I felt like I was for those 18 years was a manager of my building. And it was... 15 different hats, sometimes all in one day you had to wear. And so I never felt like I was doing what I really went back to school to do, and that was to be an instructional leader. And so we rocked along there in one of those earlier meetings with John. Gregory Patterson had, had a rip at the cemetery at work one afternoon. And John's laying out, sirens are going off, helicopters are landing, and John's still hammering on the homework that I have to do. <laughs> I said, how do you expect me to do all of your stuff and still run this school? And I wrote down your answer, John. <laughs> this is I'm how scared. You, this is how you run the school now. That's what John said. And I said, I don't think you understand, Mr. Ghost. That's one of our kids. And when that happens, your stuff, I'll say stuff since we have ladies present, your stuff is going on the back burner, and I'm going to take care of kids just like I always had. And so that's what he meant when we've had some, some interesting conversations. And so either by design of the project or just his personality, he pushed, and he pushed, and he pushed. I think he could sense my commitment to Buffalo Island Central, but also my reluctance to change. I'm an old guy that's been doing it my way a long time, and so... It was difficult for me to change in that time, so I appreciate him doing that. So now, at that pro at that point, I had to learn that we had to use some others to help us get through this project. And that's where the idea of the Guiding Coalition came along. There is a book, by the way, Mr. Taylor, that talks about two ways you can become a member of the Guiding Coalition. What's the name of that book, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I would test my PLC knowledge. It'd only be as close to retirement as 
design would get Bible saving. <laughs> that book is learning by doing. And in learning by doing, there are two ways you, you can become a member of the guiding coalition. You can be appointed to that by your administrator, or you can make application complete with references from your colleagues. Well, I chose to do that so that I would never hear someone say, I didn't want to be on this, you put me on this, and I'd like to get off of it. So we went to that, and that was a eye-opening experience for me. The first real attempt at some collaboration, just to hear other ideas, and to think, I don't have to do all of it anymore. I've got people I can run some ideas by with great ideas, okay? And so we changed that as part of our structure, and uh, that became really a, an eye-opener for me and probably added some years to my career. <laughs> and even now, because of that, uh, just recently we've interviewed some folks, and John helped us create some uh, for Dan and Eddie's purposes, and John... We now have some things called collective commitments. A list of about 10 things that our staff says, I'm going to do. And we now send those out to the candidates that are going to come in for an interview so that they know up front, this is what I'm getting into when I come to work at Buffalo Island Central. We now have members of teams setting in at interviews and asking content-specific questions. Uh, we had a band guy years ago that left, and he says, you're about to interview some folks. Here are some questions that you need to ask. And I read them, I said, how am I supposed to know if the answer is right? He's, I'm going to give you the answers to them. So they've been a big help for that, and so I appreciate that. Now into changes for students. And this is exciting for me because, like Mr. Taylor said, when I went to that first institute, I thought, wait a minute. I, I need to look up every past student that sat in front of me and apologize <laughs> because I very seldom offered any second chance learning. I taught what I thought was the right way to teach, which was the program for effective teacher method, method pet model. I graded it, put it in my grade book, and I went on to the next section. And when I went to that institute and learned that we have to find a way for kids to have second chance learning, that was an eye opener as well. And so that's some of the changes that we've gone through. Some of the aha moments, I think for our students is that they do realize they do get a second chance. Now, they are going to be retested and retaught and then retested. Now for some kids, that opens up an opportunity to not prepare for the first assessment, but we'll work through that as well, all right? And also, I think that they have learned that it's okay if you need a second chance. If you did not grasp everything the first time around, you can get some help and get some extended learning in that. And then finally, the last couple of things, uh, I think that our kids would say that our teachers have changed their amount of instruction from massive eight-page assessments down to a narrow focus of learning targets, I think our students would say that that was a big deal for them, right? I don't think they will know the terminology of central standards, but I have been in classrooms during our RTI period and said, do you know why you're in here? And in one example, they said, I don't know what a biome is. She's not letting me out of here until I learn what <laughs> So that's a narrow focus down to that. So we are beginning to celebrate successes. We did some, Mr. Hurst did some, some heavy lifting this year, and it's not just for the kids at the top end, okay? We've offered some rewards for kids that just have some movement on the Aspire from in need of support up to close. We're gonna offer them uh, some rewards for that. And then finally, the four day school week, here's the note that I have for that, and I'll be done. What's not to love? about being out of school on Friday. Yeah. <laughs> and I love about being out of school on Friday. Does it compact everything else? Yes, and this is our first year to do that. So we're having to learn that you might not should plan nine field trips in six days of school. <laughs> we're having to learn those kind of things. But we'll work through that and come out better on the other side. All right, that's it for me. Before I get
get started with what I'm up here to speak about. I'm, I'm going to go off script because I know it drives John crazy. Um, there are there are some things that, that need to be said before I begin speaking about our collaboration time. And that is, first, to the Department of Ed, we really appreciate this opportunity because I think everyone in our, our district would agree it's been an eye-opener. Um, it's, it's shown us things that, that not only we weren't doing well, but how we can improve on our existing methods and just improve all the way around. So without their, their assistance in this, this would not have been possible. And then to John, he, he's right. We, we had some interesting conversations, but I want to tell Solution Tree that they, without a doubt, sent the correct person for this job. Um, there are different, there are difficult personalities sometimes, and sometimes things don't go as like you, like you thought, but I will say that John worked through every one of our issues with us, and um, he is, he's a really good, really good guy, so, to John. But the last group is to this group of teachers. Yeah. Uh, to our group of teachers, and, and I'm going to speak for K through 12, even though I don't, I don't work as closely with uh, K6. I, I know every one of you, and I'll just say this. Um, we were so fortunate to have so many different people from Solution Tree come into our schools this year. I mean, I, I tried to write them down and I lost count because I knew I would forget some people. But every time that they came, they said, you've got great people. Every time. And so all of these things we're talking about, about today, this is a celebration day. And I just feel that we should celebrate the people who are responsible for this. And that's our teachers because it would have been so easy to, to cash it in and quit because it's very difficult. This is not easy. Nothing about this was easy. Nothing. It was very difficult. And I think our staff not only rose to the challenge, but they exceeded everyone's expectations. This is a this is something that I feel is going to be beneficial for, for our school district for as long as we're here. Um, and so I just want to say to our staff, thank you for for everything that you've done because without you this this would not have been possible. You worked your tails off and, and it is noted. So we appreciate that. Um, so I'm here to talk about some ahas for our teachers, and I think after after talking to some to some teachers, speaking with John, the one thing that comes to mind to me is how we built in some collaboration. We didn't have that before. Um, when we began this began this process three years ago, our teachers were very apprehensive. All right, there was a lot of unknowns, and historically, teachers have always been isolated creatures. We, we all can sit here and think about it. We've all done our own thing in our own classroom. And typically what that meant was we would teach, we would test, and we would move on. That's how we work as educators. Um, and it became very apparent in the early stages of this process that isolation would no longer be an option. Um, through the process, you learn real quick that the only way, the only way that this will work is through collaboration. In order to provide the best education possible to all of our students, we had to prioritize it. Now, prioritizing collaboration was different for teachers. It was different for administrators. For our end, we had to build some things in. And the first thing we did was at the secondary level, we built in collaboration time for all of our core teachers so they had the same prep periods. That was a big thing for us because that meant looking at the master schedule, reworking that, <laughs> and making sure that these teachers all had common planning time which allowed them then to have weekly scheduled meetings. So much happened in those weekly meetings. Um, in these meetings, teachers were working collectively or collaboratively and taking collective responsibility for the success of each student. Uh, so we came together as a group with one job, and that one job was to make sure that our students were successful. That's big because we didn't do that before. Something that simple changed the way that we do business here. And so I think that's a big thing. The days of working in isolation are over at Buffalo and Central. To sustain the process, we've got to continue working together as collaborative teams. So after three years, I'm proud to say that collaboration has become the norm and our staff has embraced the PLC process. Our teachers have moved from an, from an interest to a commitment, all right? So that, let me explain that. When you have an interest in something, you do it when it's convenient. But when you have a commitment to something, you accept no excuses, only results. I think that sums up our staff here. Mm -hmm. 
we used to have an interest in our education. We wanted the best for our kids, but now that we're committed, we will accept nothing other uh, than the results, and the results are going to be good. Uh, teachers are now committed to the four critical questions. So in these meetings, as John kind of hit on earlier, we're going to ask, what do we want our students to know? How are we going to know if they learn it? How will we respond when some students don't learn? And how will we extend the learning for students who are already proficient? did this through the implementation of our RTI period that, that took care of some of this. But again, back to the collaboration. That's the topic of the meetings. Team, uh, team meetings are centered around these questions and everyone comes together to figure out solutions. That's where we're at now. This is what education looks like at Buffalo Allison Drill today. And because of this, we are committed to sustaining the PLC process in order to ensure that all students learn at high levels. And I will turn it over to our teens at this point who have a presentation. Let's give it up for Bruce. Uh, I'm Bruce Fires. I'm the agriculture teacher. Uh, I was, uh, I guess I put in an application for uh, the Singleton group. Uh, which, in a school this size, most everybody are singleton because we only have one tenth grade, you know, English teacher, or maybe one ninth grade math teacher. Um, but something that really uh, was a challenge, struggle at first, was to figure out where um, our singleton group, which was the fine arts teachers and the CTE, career technical education teachers, uh, where we fit in, you know. First, uh, and, and like they talked about, this thing is a very, very liquid. You cannot be rock solid in this. And uh, we found that very early because we tried to take our CTE classes and our fine arts classes and somehow find a common ground with core classes. That was very, very hard. So... We went back as really two different groups, fine arts group and a CTE group, and that's who made up our singletons. Um, the CTE teachers, myself, our business teacher and our family consumer science teachers, uh, teacher, we found common ground in ways to maybe make a living for kids, help kids make a living, or figure out how they can get um, employed. So things like resume, building resumes, uh, soft skills, being able to look at somebody in the eye and shake their hand. That was very, very important to us because when they leave here, some of these kids may not go to college. They need to be able to go get a job and supply or uh, provide for the families. So, uh, and then on the, the fine arts side, we looked at them as a way to enhance life. To help to appreciate things, to look at things uh, maybe different than you would have without fine arts. Uh, and when you really boil down to it, all of our singleton groups are a fine arts type thing. Uh, something that we had working in our favor was we had we had proof because we are project based learning. You can either weld or you can either be improving to be a welder. You can either get the correct note, which I cannot do no matter what. <laughs> but our teachers and our, our band teacher and our choir teacher, they can make it work and help these kids. Um, so, I mean, it all boils down to we... We looked at this as a way to be able to send our kids out, whether they want to, ex, you know, extend their education, uh, further their education through college, uh, or be able to go into the, you know, uh, employment right out of high school. And we hope, as singletons in, in this group, uh, we hope that we were, you know, a positive influence on these kids. So that's that's kind of where we were. I know, you know, they, the thing about it, these math teachers. Yes, there may only be one 10th grade, one 8th grade math teacher, 
but they kind of had a common ground. Our singleton group did not. So we had to figure that out on our own, which is, is great. John helped us a bunch. Uh, our administration helped us a bunch. We always were looking for better ways to uh, help these kids, and that's what it's all about. So that's all I got. Yay, Emily. Um, I'm Emily Collins. I'm here to represent the hospital match team. Um, the, one of my favorite things about the PLC process is using RTI time to help kids who need intervention. Uh, before we had this time built into the day, you either had to use class time for intervention, which then your kids who already understood the material, um, it's almost like you were wasting their time to have to help the kids who needed the extra intervention or they would pull them out of lunch. Well, then it's almost looked at as punishment, and you don't want to punish kids just because they need a little extra help. Um, so RTI time, it's not, I don't really feel like they look at it as a punishment now. I even have kids ask if they can be pulled for RTI sometimes. <laughs> um, now, when you have as many kids as what most teachers have, it's difficult to determine who needs intervention and who doesn't. So we were just keeping, uh, list on paper until I think it was John showed us this. Um, so basically you put your students names in a spreadsheet and then you write them using this scale and it's something that can be done quickly like the last two minutes of class you can go through real quick you don't have to sit down and grade papers and figure that out um, it only takes a couple minutes and it helps you be sure that you don't miss anybody. Uh, we also learned how to make unit plans the correct way. Um, so at the beginning of the process, we looked at essential standards and determined which ones were essential and which ones could just be used as extensions. But even after we did that, I was still a little confused on how that applied to a unit plan. So when our math person, Tashana, came in and showed us how to put the standards in a unit plan and use IPAN statements, um, to make sure that you hit all of your standards at some point and make sure that you spend most of your time on the essential ones versus the non-essential ones. Because if you try to teach every single standard in depth, you would never finish. You would need <laughs> multiple years. Um, and we can't keep our kids in school until they're 25. So this really helped with making sure that we hit all of our standards. Uh, other aha moments, uh, we changed our conversations to how can I teach this better versus the kids aren't trying. So as a teacher, there are a lot of things you can't control. You can't control what kids go home to. A lot of them go home to just rough situations, and we can't really do anything about that. But what we can change is how we treat them at school. We can't just blame them, say that it's their fault when they don't understand. Maybe they're not putting forth as much effort as they should, but there's usually an underlying reason behind that. And if you will take the time to show them that you're going to make sure they learn. Like if you tell them you're not leaving my classroom until you understand what a biome is or how to solve a system of equations, then they'll, that shows them that you care. And then also using the ICANN statements to plan assessments and lessons. Next steps for our team. Um, we have been involved in the interview process for new hires. We're hiring two new math teachers next year. And that was very exciting to be able to sit in on those. So before it would have been just the administrators who hired. And then I would worry all summer about who they hired. <laughs> <laughs> There's the truth. <laughs> uh, you just don't know what you're getting into. So now we know. We know who was hard. We got to experience that. And we maybe we did a bad job. We won't know. But at least I'm confident that I think that we will to share in the blame. <laughs> and then we can also, now that we have done this work, provide essential standards and pacing guides for new hires. Seven years ago, as a first-year math teacher, I would have loved 
first I wanted to have given me that. Instead, I took the book and I decided to teach every single standard in the book. Come on. Uh, we're going to continue our weekly critical occurrence meetings, especially with new teachers. I think that will be beneficial to them. And we hope that in the future we can meet with elementary teachers to work on vertical alignment. Um, because I'm not really that familiar with elementary standards, and I would like to be that way I know uh, what I need to cover that maybe I'm assuming that they learned it, but they haven't. And then here are some products that Ms. Watney uses in her classroom. She is probably the best person on our team uh, as far as using Darkane statements and having the kids track their own learning. So when we first started this process, I was torn on having students like rate themselves and keep up with their own learning because you have to use class time to do that. You have to give kids class time to reflect on how they feel like they are doing on specific learning targets. Uh, but what, what we found was that if they're invested in the learning, then they're just more likely to care about what you have to say in your class. and I am um, on the literacy team. Um, first, our literacy team would like to thank Solution Tree for sending us the absolute perfect coach. Uh, Mr. Honest Check has been vital in our progress over the last three years. Um, he is a practicing teacher, and he understands the mastery and knowledge of English as well as a multitude of strategies on how to actually get that information to the students and um, he's just phenomenal. The five of us could not have handpicked a better coach than uh, Honest Check to help us along this process. Today our team would like to celebrate the fact that with Mr. Honest Check's witty guidance and our norm of the meetings must always have chocolate, of course. <laughs> that we've successfully shifted to a standards-based method of teaching. Uh, and away from... Uh, well, let's just say uh, irrelevant assignments. Um, we're now more focused on skills and abilities than um, doing an assignment because it's fun. Um, our team also great, greatly appreciated the shift from doing everything individually on our own little island and coming together collaboratively so that we have more, um, we have support now that we didn't have before. And we have people to bounce ideas off of and someone to say, okay, I taught it this way, but your scores were better. What did you do? So we can try that. Um, through the PLC process, our team created some very beautiful works in the art of teaching. Very beautiful. I enjoy a, um, a graph and a chart in English. I have one of my, um, one of my team members makes fun of me because I put everything in a chart. It's okay. Anyway, we're incredibly uh, proud of our little works of art. And our reading and writing portfolios uh, top that list. They are vertically aligned, 712. And they promote and encourage student autonomy as well as fostering a growth mindset with, within each student. Each student can track themselves over the course of the year. They can see their progress. They can reflect on how their year was used effectively. Students and teachers no longer have to start from scratch at the beginning of the year as the portfolios provide each with an accurate picture of where the student left off the year before and where they need to begin. 
This allows the teacher and the student to know the deficiencies at any point in time, whether you just got the student or whether it's the student looking back going, oh, I need help in this. Um, they can not only look at these since they're 712, they now have access to see their entire journey, not only through junior high, but through high school as the English standards progress. Our biggest celebration, however, isn't a tangible piece of work that we've created. Um, though we consider our portfolios our little beautiful masterpieces, we certainly understand that they are not museum quality and that they are not perfect specimens and great for the to hang in the gallery. We understand that as we ourselves grow as teachers and as a team, that our portfolios and any other work we do, as you know, aside from our portfolio, they'll still need to be molded and sculpted and refined to make sure that they um, meet the needs of every student who comes along. We might we know that we you know may have to go back and look at them and rework them. And it's that shift in mindset that the English team is the most grateful for. Not just everything else, but most we are most grateful for um, the shift towards collaboration and the shift towards knowing that nothing is set in stone and we can always go back and redo something so to further help the kids. And we thank you. I think we have some out here. It's okay. <laughs> um, I'm Brian X. This is Mr. Glenn. I cannot say her first name. She's Mr. Glenn. <laughs> I can pronounce it, but I just. Anyways, um, I teach science and I'm a science learner in Ms. Strickland teaches biology and AP biology and environmental science and all the other classes. Um, so I'm going to let her present the slides, but I just want to kind of give a little bit of background about our team first. Um, <coughs> of course, I just do not have near as much experience as Ms. Strickland does. Um, I have learned a lot from her. When we first started out, it was Ms. Strickland and Ms. Fleeman. And I learned a lot from both of them, but I was very intimidated by them because I was so much younger than them. And I'm like, okay, now I'm their leader. Like, how do I, how do I do this? And John helped a lot, and of course, Mr. Rose and Mr. Harris helped a lot. And um, but we've been through four physical science and chemistry teachers in two years. We've had a lot of ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. A lot of changing, a lot of new things. Um, when we first started in this building, I was on the different side of the building than the other two science teachers. And so now we've switched rooms and I'm right beside them. So all three of us are together. All three of us can collaborate in between classes. And then, of course, our um, team meetings. And it's just, we've changed a lot, I feel like. Um, Ms. Chickland's leading us this year. She says, I don't. They're still trying to help me. <laughs> she says she's leading us this year. She says she's retiring after this year. And so it's going to be interesting carrying this new journey over with our new physical science chemistry teacher who is going to change positions into biology and Mr. Cook's position and then getting a new chemistry and physical science teacher. So we're excited to learn a lot. I feel like we've learned a lot. I feel like we're behind every other team, but we've had so many obstacles, kind of like Mr. Taylor was talking about, like the pandemic and tornado, we've had our own team obstacles and challenges that we've had to overcome. Yeah, you got some slides. Yeah. All right. Well, we started, when we first started this bus, I kind of got to talk about a little bit. Uh, in the very beginning, they kind of wanted me to do the, the uh, be part of the fabric coalition. And um, I'm kind of an old crotchety teacher. I've been <laughs> around a long time. Um, been down lots of rivers and watched lots of boats sent out by the State Department. Just thank you very much. <laughs> I've been through COE and PLC and helping others in between. And when they asked me the very first time, he, he wants a full five or a fist. Everybody does their thing and I go, hmm, no. 
I'm old. I know what I'm doing. I do my job. Not really ready to give it up. Well, we first started looking, and I had not really looked really deep. I liked the old Arkansas standards. I liked the old ones. I knew what I was doing. I, I didn't really want to change that too much. And I still am not real crazy about the national standards. <laughs> but we had to take a hard look at them. And I had decided, you know what? What I teach exceeds them. I don't care. I'm going to do what I do. And so that's kind of where I was at the beginning of this process. And I have seen a lot of positives. Okay, so we first had to start by taking a good look about the standards, looking at what they were looking at, looking at project-based learning, looking at turning loose of a little of my autonomy, which is kind of <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's laughing, and I'm fixing to get you in a minute. So anyway, that's how we started with that. So, had to look at that, see how we align vertically and horizontally. <laughs> All right. So, we looked at the NGSS standards and looked at some of this project-based learning. Uh, this is using Skittles, I think, to make uh, a little bit of fireworks. So, we looked at, uh, maybe just looked at real-world application of the science, um, and it took an enormous amount of time on the front side simply because I really didn't want to learn the NGSS standards for about three years. Sorry. I was ready to do my little thing and I knew I was good at what I did, so I didn't think I really had a lot to learn from that process. But we <laughs> did look through it and did learn how to tear them apart and break them down. All right, so we looked at the NGSS standards and um, this is a picture of um, Okay. Yeah, gel electrophoresis. I don't, lost a word. So that's why I'm retiring. Uh, we made it. We collectively realized that those standards aren't enough. You know, we we can look at those standards and we can try really hard to teach every one of those standards. But when we looked at the environmental standards, I did two projects that I could say I taught every single standard in my NGSS standards with those two projects, and my kids would walk out of my room knowing nothing, and nobody would know what a stinking bio was, by the way. So, that, they're very big. And we decided that, you know, we need to really focus on the standards, but we also need to make sure that we are preparing our kids for the real world. Uh, PL, PLC may spend more time reflecting on what we teach, why we will teach what we do. I had really up front when I first started teaching biology several years ago, took an enormous amount of time, looked at the state standards, broke them down, made sure that I was meeting the standards. And I think probably that came from a kid who came from a little podunk country school and went to college and felt like I hadn't learned what I needed to know. And I wanted my kids to go to college and know what they needed to know. So I worked very hard at making sure that my kids knew what they needed to do. And this made us, you know, really reflect on what works, what doesn't. And over the years, one of the things that had happened, I think, along the way was, and Mr. Rose elaborated a little bit, in the old days with the pet model and, and the old school where we came from, kids didn't get it. You did your best to teach it. If you had to reteach, you spent one day, and then you moved on because, buddy, there wasn't time to go any deeper. You did what you had to do. And so it made us look at what worked and what didn't. Made us go back and say, well, you know, there are a few of these standards might not be super important if we know the difference between a monocot and a dicot. We might maybe spend a little bit more time on DNA. You know, <laughs> some of those things. Made us look at why they're not successful in some units. Is it me? Is it something I'm doing? Is there a trick out there somewhere that somebody else knows? Like, Maybe the periodic table is not much more than a calendar. Oh, wow. I wish somebody had taught me that and said, great. It forced us to look deep at our scores. I always have been super competitive. I'll tell you this. When I, uh, the, the scores come in, first thing I do is pull up the State Department webpage. I look at the schools all around us in the county. Then I look at Valley View to see if they beat me. If they didn't beat me, I'm good. They usually do. Um, but that's, I'm, I'm an athlete, I'm a coach, that's what I do. I'm super competitive. 
forced us to look at our standards, not only what our schools were, but wait a minute. Why can't any of our kids disaggregate data? Why can't they correct? Why are they struggling with that? Why are they struggling with these things? So I made us look at those things. It helped us communicate about ways to reteach units when necessary. When we do our critical friend, by the way, I, this is where I'm getting me, Mr. Yost. The first time we did it, I popped in with my <laughs> critical friend, and I had laid out all my stuff, every single thing that I do, you know, and I'm pretty methodical. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a true north. I know where I'm going. I, I know how to get there. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do it right. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, and by God, I'm going to show you all of it. So, did it. He's sitting there, and I can see him gulping hard, scared to death. <laughs> He's going to make me mad. <laughs> Am I wrong? No, you're right. <laughs> I was a little nervous. <laughs> he tells me what, going, what he wants to tell me, and I'm like, thanks. You know, I was okay with it. I was, and I think that even, and I think you probably, we talked about that this morning. I have a tendency, because I'm sure of myself, because I'm vocal, to be a little condescending. A little bit. <laughs> Maybe people think that about me, but when they really get to know me, that's not the truth. It's it's really not. So he was kind of afraid to let me know what I needed to be doing that was different. And he was like, Well, if these are your main things, then why are those your essay questions? And I was like, Well, I never really got thought about it. It's addressed here and here and here, but I hadn't thought about that. I'll do that from now on. So it made us. Look at that, gave us outside perspective. It's stuff that, you know, I thought I had it all together. I thought I knew pretty much everything there was. No, maybe not so much. Uh, it gave us common playing time. So when we were talking about things and bouncing things off each other, I mean, especially when Brian was down the hall, you know, I never saw Brian. I didn't ever get to talk to Brian about anything. And it does give us time to, hey, we just did so and so. Hey, I want you to look at this picture. I want you to, you know, See, look what they did. You know, we talk a lot more than we used to. Communicate a lot more. And I think it's helpful. It doesn't feel like you're on an island. Okay? It made us put more emphasis on labs and graphing uh, to teach our materials at higher the okay levels. Um, these are actual labs. Uh, these are actual labs that we do in class. This, one on the beers and the wolves is an environmental science lab. Um, that one is actually a um, solubility lab from chemistry. So those are things that we actually do. And making sure that kids understand at a higher level that they do. Kids learn from doing. I'm a kinesthetic learner. I get it. So it gave us RTI to reteach when necessary. That's a definite thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> All those years when we thought, they're not getting it, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I've got three kids not getting it. Everybody else has. I need to move on. You know, especially when we used to teach a mile wide and an inch deep. Yeah. And I think, personally, that Ms. Strickland, who knew it to be this leader that she was driving, she's on for many years because she's a planner. She makes a plan. She sticks to that plan. She's now on something else where she's retiring. That someone who is retiring this year is still to this day changing her teaching yeah. to better herself and better for her students. And so to me, that is a huge success of our journey here. Well said. I'm Catherine Wren, the head of the social studies department. And can I just take a moment to say how difficult it is to follow Ms. Strickland, who was my teacher in middle school. She started teaching at five, if you didn't know. Uh, she was five years old. Uh, so, yeah. I was a baby queen. You, you were. That is that you were a baby. Uh, but anyway, I, I'm very grateful to be here. I was told to apply for this position. So, uh, I, I'm grateful to do that. And hopefully, I can figure out how to work this better. All right. Yes, so our PLC journey as a social studies team has been a little bit different. I started this journey as both a social studies teacher and an English teacher, so I'm kind of the fifth wheel on the English team still. Uh, I just keep clinging on, and they keep letting me eat their chocolate, so it works out very well. Uh, 
So we have a lot of strong tie-in between our social studies and English teams by virtue of my former position. At, I'm now solely high school social studies, but also by virtue of our content and how well it fits together. So when we first started this journey, uh, there were three social studies teachers, technically two and a half, and I was the half person. Uh, and we had no common planning time. In fact, we were on separate ends of the building, and I probably had not seen the person who had, <laughs> whose position I took over when she moved to Fax. I had probably not seen her, but maybe twice, and I had her daughter in class. So uh, it was wonderful to be able to have uh, planning now, and because we share a half person still with the math team, Ms. Walking has common planning with the math team, but she is right next door to Ms. Costno, and we still are able to collaborate there, and it's so much better, uh, because now moving into a full-time social studies position, even though I'm the team leader, I feel like I have the support that I need from teachers who have far more experience uh, than I do. So now we have... Uh, Planning period. And I wasn't sure if I was presenting my slides or someone else. I'm not generally one to talk about myself in the third person here. Uh, but I now I am frequently <laughs> included in these English teams as well. So uh, let's, we have to start with unpacking our standards. And if you're not familiar with the way that Arkansas and most of the nation as a whole does social studies education, there's a huge hurdle in the fact that it's not linear. You have world history to study, you have geography to study, you have US history to study, and those subjects are mixed around, and it's kind of a mixed bag as to what you will get in any particular year. And so as the high school US history teacher, I have students who have not had any history since, or any history from the Civil War since the fifth grade. And so that is a challenge. Uh, but we were able to go through our standards determine what is the most important, not only in building a knowledge that connects world history and geography and U.S. history, but also connects to the life skills that students will be using, like <coughs> English, reading charts and decades, and disaggregating data and science. And so we are, I feel like the social studies team is the support team behind the other teams. And so we were able to do that work through the common planning time that Solution Tree has granted to us. So after unpacking all of these standards and these skills that we need to assess, we were able to work as a team and determine how to build those skills from 7th through 12th grade. Our assessment coach will be back next week and we're going to continue that work of how to, what does a social studies research project look like in 12th grade and how do we step that down to go with 7th grade and then how does that also fit in with the skills that they are learning about researching and writing in seventh grade and work that back up to 12th grade through English. So we're aligning with our literacy skills and in fact in my lesson plans I've been putting literacy standards alongside with the uh, social studies <laughs> standards because I'm still an English teacher even though you, uh, I'm not in the English department so to speak. It's, it's still what I know better than even my, my social studies content standards. So it's been a helpful bridge for me in a new content area. And we're also aligning uh, that with the segregation that science is doing and their data and math is doing in their projects as well. So the way that our teaching has changed in the social studies department is we are now no longer textbook dependent teachers. I don't know if you've had a social studies teacher who opened a chapter one. Today we're reading section one about the War of 1812, and we'll answer the questions in the back. And then we go to the next section, and the next section. And hopefully by the end of the year, maybe you've made it to the end of World War II. Uh, we are no longer doing that. We're teaching in a way that emphasizes analysis of the history itself, of primary documents, of sources, and looking at accounts from what we like to call dueling historians, uh, who have two different viewpoints. And so the image here is from our AP U.S. History field trip to the Civil Rights Museum, and some of these documents and uh, materials they had seen before, but then they actually get to go see the, the real product. So we are, again, working with our other teams here, and I want to highlight something that Ms. Costco does, a couple of her projects are just amazing. She's not 
in here with us right now, but her economics class helps support mathematics and science instruction through projects that she calls Shark Tank, where the students have to uh, provide a business plan and a product and then model that for judges. And then the judges decide how they would, uh, if they would buy into that and give the world money to that or not. Uh, and then I had a student come up to me just uh, last week and talk to me about filing her taxes. And she said, I like how to do that in this cross nose class this year. And so that was really special. I wanted to share that. Uh, again, I'm talking about myself as a third person, apparently. But uh, my class, we were able to partner with the English department and do a project over William Shakespeare. The 10th and 11th grade English teacher was teaching uh, Hamlet and Julius Caesar and looking at Shakespeare, and so we took historical evidence, looked at existing signatures for Shakespeare, his will, uh, the education levels of his children, tried to determine if Shakespeare was one person, or not a real person at all, or if Shakespeare was multiple people, or a pen name, and so we looked at arguments from other historians, and the students had to follow a process where they examined primary sources, and examined conflicting accounts from different credible historians. They had to construct their own arguments on who they think the real world Shakespeare was, uh, and then had to write an essay, an argument over who they thought Shakespeare was, present that to the English team and <coughs> our administrators who served as judges. And then not only did they have to present, have to present who they thought Shakespeare really was, but they had to tie that into how they thought we should instruct about that, ideas on how we should teach this controversy to future grades of students. And of course, we had some cash prizes for that. So here are our winners for that contest. It was so much fun to read their essays, to watch them use skills that they learned in English and realize, oh, I can use this in other areas of my life. And of course, I think our greatest gift from the Solution Tree process has been RTI. And I think we've dropped those letters quite a bit uh, today, but if you're not sure what that stands for, it's response to intervention, and intervention is, is the key part of that here. So we started our RTI process, Ms. Crossno, Ms. Watney, and I, not really sure where this was going or how to do it. And so early on in the year, we were dealing with massive quarantines of students. Uh, who were out for two weeks of instruction. So they weren't there to get the original learning, or they were there for part of it and then gone for the rest as quarantine <coughs> happened. And we learned that it wasn't necessarily the content that students were struggling with. Sometimes it was the type of question, because the questions that, this is my data, the questions that I was giving were negatively worded questions, because the ACT gives several of those. And that's a question that asks for all of the following except are true, or which of the following is not. And I thankfully was able to collaborate with two other teachers who had taught this type of skill before. And at the end of it, we were seeing massive improvement. And so not only is RTI a great time for intervention, but it's also an excellent time for extension, especially with social studies. And so this is Ms. Cosno's junior high quiz bowl uh, group here. I have also been able to review for the AP exams with my high school students, and it's been such an excellent time to take learning further in ways that kids are interested in, to give them some autonomy over their own choices. So thank you very much for this process. Elementary school's next. Yes, and we've been here a while, so do we need a stretch break? Would you like to have a restroom break? Do you want to just roll on? Talk to you guys. I think we need a break. Yeah. Okay, let's take, let's take, a, let's take a five minute break and then come back in the elementary and put together something really special. Yeah.
I think I know everyone here. Kevin Stewart, uh, the elementary school principal. And our presentation is a bit different because we are continuing to be involved in our state assessment process, the ATCT Aspire. And so we elected to create a video internally because we didn't know how many students we'd have out. And so that is what you'll see from us. Rather, our, our guiding coalition is present today. And we hope that you will speak to them, but our presentation will be done by video. Let me let our guests know that on Buffalo Island, there are two areas that are critical to our stability and to our survival. And those are agriculture and education. And in 1978, a popular radio broadcaster, Paul Harvey, presented an infamous speech, So God Made a Farmer. And today I'm going to borrow his pattern of thought. And on the eighth day, God looked down on his creation and said, it's going to take a lot of learning to know how to take care of my paradise so that it can prosper. So God made the PLC prosper. God said, I need teachers that are willing to focus on common goals in order to ensure not that students are taught, but that students learn. I need teachers that are willing to be mutually accountable for student learning by identifying essential skills and to understand when those skills should be taught. I need teachers that can work interdependently to analyze instructional practices in order to improve results. I need teachers that will collaborate and share their best practices with others in order to impact learning. I need teachers that know how to assess student learning fairly. And teachers that know what to do when students haven't learned, as well as what to do when students have mastered learning. I need teachers that understand that the humans that I have created are not intended to be perfect. So they may need second, third, fourth chances offered to them with patience, kindness, and encouragement. I need teachers that know that my human beings learn best by doing. So God made mm -hmm. professional learning communities, and this is our story. <laughs> Greetings from the campus of Buffalo Island Central Elementary School, where approximately 450 students, faculty, and staff gather and commit to quality education each day. In August of 2018, BIC moved into this new $7.5 million state-of-the-art educational facility, and later that spring, BIC was selected by the Arkansas Department of Elementary and Secondary Education as the only district to be included in cohort three for professional learning communities training guided by a solution tree. This was a three-year commitment and little did we know at that time that the world as we had always known it was quickly coming to an end. During year one of the PLC process, our key focuses were on the revision of our school's mission and vision statements, as well as identifying essential learning. Year one ended abruptly, 10 weeks earlier than normal, due to the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic. PLC year two continued amidst the challenge of pivoting to virtual learning and adapting to virtual teaching. The adult learning was amazing, and our PLC efforts continued with the patience and the support of our PLC coaches. In the winter, we endured a 10-day ice storm that left most of our district without power or internet. Also during this year, we explored the possibility of a four-day school week, and subsequently, with the support of our community, 
made the decision to shift to a new school calendar of Monday through Thursday extended days for the 21-22 school year. And then we arrived at year three, assuming that the worst was behind us, but instead our challenges were just beginning. We were faced with an obvious and significant loss of learning carried over from year two. The COVID crisis continued, bringing the highest rate of absenteeism in our school's history. Yet these were not our worst obstacles. On the evening of December 10th, our communities were hit by an F4 tornado that left 30 families homeless, destroyed our large local nursing home and other businesses, and took two lives. Our school campuses immediately became crisis centers as we shifted to meeting the immediate needs of food, clothing, and household goods. Winter 2022 brought with it yet another ice storm and a raging flu A. Remarkably, during every crisis situation, Buffalo Island Central never abandoned the PLC process of learning. While it was an unconventional path, we overcame monumental challenges and stayed the course. This is the story of our PLC journey and how we have moved from surviving to thriving. After the PLC Institute, I quickly realized the value of teams and team time in a school. From that point on, we realized that collaboration was key and we completely revamped every single schedule that ever existed at the elementary school. At this building, we run three separate schedules. We run a schedule for kindergarten through second grade, a third and fourth grade schedule, as well as a fifth and sixth grade schedule. The transition to a four-day week for BIC was huge for us. Our goal in this whole process was to protect core instruction time so kids would not be missing their core instruction classes. What we did was we were able to develop two different RTI extra periods in order to help students. We have a win time, which is what I need. It's a 40-minute class period every day for each student here, as well as an RTI period that lasts 60 minutes a day. So we have the hour and 40 minutes daily to do both interventions and enrichment and extensions to learning. My favorite thing about the school is being with my friends. Because you get to make new friends. My favorite thing about school is you have friends that care about you. Uh, I make friends. My favorite thing about school is getting to meet my friends. As an elementary counselor, I have worked on a social emotional component of the RTI process. Social emotional learning is important to both children and adults, increasing self awareness, academic achievement, and positive behaviors both in and out of the classroom. While we have some positive incentives in place, such as our brag box, we have now implemented positive office referrals. We also have our BIC elementary expectations ready to start the new school year in 2022 23. This will be a school-wide endeavor, and I'm looking forward to the positive aspects this will bring to our school climate. As the PLC process states, success in school and in a work environment requires the ability to consistently demonstrate appropriate behaviors. In addition to academic skills and knowledge, some academic and social behaviors are critical to developing a successful learner. We feel very confident with our new expectations for grades K through 6 that our students will learn, master and generalize socially appropriate behaviors that will help them not only academically, but also help them become a productive citizen. We will also be implementing a positive incentive program for attendance in our 2022-23 school year. For the past two years, attendance has been challenging. In a survey of more than 2,500 teachers in eight countries, which was carried out in October, November 2020, there was one thing everyone seemed to agree on. Online learning is not as effective as classroom-based teaching. At BIC, we have definitely learned that face-to-face -face instruction is best for not only our students, but also our staff. 
Being in the classroom allows our students to have hands-on learning experiences. As Rick DeFore stated, the message of learning by doing is we must be working at the work, making the mistakes, then learning from these mistakes. Face-to-face -face instruction affords us these opportunities, therefore our students can grow and succeed. Through the PLC process, I am eager to continue forward in the new school year with positive programs for our students, our families, and our staff. I love school because I learn my letters and I learn to read books. My favorite thing is learning. I'm learning. I love our school because we get to learn and have fun. I love school because we learn and save the Uh, one of the things that we've done this year that PLC has urged us to do is uh, a student-led progress chart where the students track their learning. They put a sticker on the letters they know, sounds they know, sight words, numbers, and they can look at their chart and see what they know, things they need to work on. We've also addressed assessing the skills that we test over. The way that we grade, we're going to try to be consistent across the board. We are circling the wrong answer, offering a chance to answer the skipped questions. We chart students' growth individually. We also chart the growth within the classroom. We get together weekly, sometimes daily, and we talk and we compare. If we're on the same page, um, we incorporate from data analysis, from early literature tests, the star reading, and our class performance, we compare. We have fluid RTI groups for reading and math that change periodically depending on the student's growth or a weakness that they might need to work on. And as a team, we enjoy these weekly meetings. We don't feel so alone. We feel like we have each other to compare and grow from, and we stay on the same page, and we just help each other in any way we can. Now, since we all say, we give the test, we've got this form on every child, <coughs> which breaks the test down into product skills, vocabulary skills, and comprehension skills. And we use this data for every week, and we compile them in a nice notebook, and we can see how the child every week is doing, and we can also see where they might be struggling in. Like, in, are they struggling in vocabulary, comprehension, or phonics skills? And we use this form to see if we need to make intervention groups and what we need to work on during intervention groups. Fluency is also a major skill in first grade. We set our ratings high. The first time we period, our first graders read 40 words a minute. Second time reads 50 words a minute. Third time we read 60 words a minute. And the last time we we expect them to read 70 words a minute. Since PLC, we have started letting the kids take ownership okay, of their fluency rates. And they can easily see the progress they're making. This has resulted in students practicing their reading more so that we can, they can improve their reading times each week. They get very excited to see that they've reached a new goal. And we get very excited also to see their improvement. Well, so we have many students start passing our goal, and we've got many students reading over 100 words a minute, and 12 students reading 200 words a minute. We're very proud of our students. In the years prior to PLC, our second grade team each owned their own subjects. There was a reading spelling class, a language writing class, and a math science class. Students did 90 minute rotations to each teacher. This idea came to be so each teacher could focus on two main subject areas. It was also thought to be good for the students. It started preparing them for the transition to third grade, where they had different teachers for each subject. When the PLC process started here at BIC, we realized that in order to have common formative assessments and in order to be able to compare student data and teaching ideas, what worked and what didn't work, we needed to transition back to self-contained classes. Making this transition back did turn out to be beneficial. 
We are now able to teach an essential skill, give a common formative assessment, then meet to analyze student data and discuss between the three of us what was effective and what wasn't. We are able to share those effective teaching strategies and go back to our own classrooms and implement them. We are also able to swap students during RTI time so the students can get the essential skill taught to them in a different way by a different teacher. Some students need just a little extra reinforcement and some students benefit from having it taught from another point of view. This is our reason to celebrate PLC. My favorite thing is at school to read because I love to read faster and faster because we get to read. I like reading. Reading. So before PLC, we were covering our standards following the current literacy curriculum in our school district. We would basically have a five-day instructional routine where we taught for four days and we tested on the fifth. What we implemented with the PLC process was working on identifying our essential standards. We met with Ms. Paula Maker, the literacy specialist, and she helped us develop unit plans. So now instead of focusing on four to five day units, we focus on eight to 10 day units. And then within that time frame, we are able to identify students' needs and meet those needs before the unit is up. Before the PLC process, reading and language were separate classes. The students attended a 45 minute class of reading and a 45 minute class of language each day. Ms. Patty and I both taught fifth and sixth graders. We tried to teach a whole grade novel several times. With reading, language, and the writing components, we were not using our time with our students efficiently. Between the transitions of moving from one class to the next, and with Patty and I checking with each other to see where the other left off in the lesson, our 45 minutes dwindled away very quickly. It took us forever to finish a novel and get through the standards we knew our students needed to master. We knew there had to be a better way, and the PLC process guided us to the best solution, block scheduling. PLC coach Paul Maker showed us how to make our new ELA block, and with Paul's help, we created a schedule for that new 100-minute block. Having reading, writing, and language together has been like the glue for our ELA learning. Now, while we're laying the foundation for learning, it's easier for us as the teachers to do, and it's easier for our students and better for them. They're better able to understand the flow of how their thinking can go from what they read, through their whole thinking process, and out on paper as a finished product. Even their response to reading seems to make more sense to them because they're now learning to think deeper on a topic. As a teacher, I love being able to go deeper into the thinking and watch my students be excited about reading. Our next step is to continue meeting in our elementary teams for evaluating data, sharing ideas, and what's working, what isn't, and what would make it better. And as the fifth and sixth grade ELA team, we intend to communicate more frequently with the junior high ELA teachers. We want to do everything possible to ensure a seamless transition from our level to their new level of learning that will help our students continue to grow. Miss Selby and Miss Rosemary collaborated this year to teach shared skills at the same time. While the science classes were studying about the dynamics of volcanic eruption, Miss Selby's social studies class was learning about the history of Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. Math because it will help me in every grade. My favorite thing about school is math. Because I like math. My favorite thing about school is math. My favorite thing about school is math. My favorite thing is about math. 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 Math teachers face is uh, helping each student in the course of a teaching period. Many times we have 
you know, uh, a large number of students that need help, and you can have a really long line up to your desk. And so one of the things that we've learned through the PLCs is, is wanting to come up with other ways that to help struggling students. And one of the ways we've done that is to establish what's called students teaching students. And we begin to in, implement this, and when a student has mastered a skill, they can become a classroom teacher and help those students that are struggling. That way, as we move through the class period, when we get more and more students that are mastering the skill, then they can go off and help those, and everybody's getting what they need. And some of the benefits of uh, students teaching students is that those that are struggling can, can get help quicker, and sometimes students can actually uh, use their vocabulary, sometimes do a better job teaching than me, <laughs> to another student. Uh, and that's one of the cool things that, that can be done with that. Those that are teaching, it strengthens them as well because they're really becoming confident with the material and uh, mastering that kind of material. So what helps us in the classroom, we're you know changing to a block style where we have a longer time period. So it allows us to have that RTI time in the classroom and using um, as a program like student teaching students is really beneficial in helping us to increase students a mastery of skills and hopefully uh, increase our, our test scores. Okay, I want to talk about the math competition that we've been doing. Please teachers realize that our math students were not getting the extension activities that they need, our higher thinking math students. And we were looking at our test scores and they weren't showing a lot of growth like we wanted them to. So seven years ago, we started the math competition in Memphis, which is called the Perennial Math. And we extended that this year for to third through sixth grade. Now, in the past, the kids would go to Memphis to compete. But due to COVID, now we have to do it online here at school, which that gives us more participation. And also in the past, the students would have to take their recess time or their free time to practice or to train for this particular competition. And through the uh, PLC, now that we have RTI, we can take that time now and have our math teams during that time and we can do those extension activities that uh, they need and that kind of gives them higher thinking skills and things that we can't really do in the classroom with everybody all right so uh let's talk a little bit about the standard the standard space report card every quarter uh, for as long as we can remember we've handed students a report card that ideally showed the percentage of information that they've retained that they've learned that they've grown with right but we as teachers we began to ask ourselves how true of a representation is that of what the student knows. We have students who come to us for more help than others, and therefore their, their grades may be a little more inflated. Some teachers teach in different methods in different ways, and some students just really proud with those different methods. So when student one receives a B and student two receives a C, is that an accurate picture of their success? So we as a math team sat down, and we knew we had to devise, to devise a plan to better communicate to students and their parents to show how they how they performed on specific tasks. So as a collaboration with us as a team in the PLC process, between different grade level teachers, we were able to determine these, uh, what we call essential skills or essential standards that students needed to master uh, for that particular grade level. And these essential skills would be written in a way that could be easily understood by families, easily communicated and put together on a supplemental uh, itemized report card to, uh, for them to see what strengths and weaknesses their students had. And it's our hope that through this report card uh, that, that it will create opportunities for their students to take that information, help their students uh, grow those skills and build those skills in which they struggle okay. to prepare them for not only now, uh, but for the future years. Because I like PE. 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 I
As our school shifted to a four-day work week and the inclusion of a true response to intervention program, an assessment tool was selected and a rotational schedule was devised. Using STAR reading and math every five weeks, as well as CFAs to demonstrate classroom performance, students were assessed and groups were determined. For Fidelity, dyslexia therapy was scheduled during this time. Every enrolled student was allowed an RTI enrichment week during each cycle in order to reward hard work and to encourage students. Each testing period, many students demonstrated mastery of all skills and qualified for daily <coughs> enrichment. These students were given the opportunity to select from a variety of classes that offered extra academic opportunities in a relaxed and fun environment. As the year progressed, more and more students were able to participate in enrichment as they mastered skills and no longer needed skill remediation. Another important component of enrichment was that it became evident that students put forth their best efforts during the testing process and test scores appeared to be more accurate. These additions include STEM activities for hands-on learning about force and motion, moon phases in space, Maker space where students were completing challenges with Legos to make marble runs or domino runs. Science experiments where students learned how the eye worked and built a model of the eye lens. And programming the new dash robots. Students learned about coding in the computer lab. Our projects include using light boards for drawing and creating 3D theme pictures. Extra <coughs> physical education opportunities to learn new games such as pickleball. In the East class created and produced our Veterans Day program and created the video that you are watching right now. Our RTI enrichment class helps with a community project for National Nursing Home March. Our class painted targets to be used in carnival games for the patients. We love helping out. And she's really like understanding and she's always helped me and stuff. And uh, when I get down, she helps me. Everything about school as a teacher because they are very good. I love my school because we have a wonderful teacher. I love our school because our teachers help us learn. I love our school because of the teachers. Thank you, Solution Dream and Arkansas Department of Education for allowing BIC to be part of cohort three. We are truly a school of learning by doing. Thank you. I've heard it said that change is the end result of all learning. The PLC process has truly changed education at BIC. In 2016, we asked our patrons to pass a millage to build new buildings, and our motto was for our kids. After PLC, we shifted our thinking to for all kids, and we can't wait to see what the future has in store for us as we soar. <laughs> No. <laughs>
Before you come up, I want to really encourage you because I talked to Dr. Wall a little bit at break from the standpoint there's been a lot of wasted money in the state of Arkansas. A lot of wasted money. And we try, it seems like every day, to try to find an easier way to get an educator into a classroom. The money the State Department has spent and is spending on Solution Tree and the PLC process is the best investment that they've ever made in my history of education. So I encourage everyone that we know, our legislators, keep pumping the money in there because there's no better way to improve education than through PLC. Yeah. Thank you. And talk about hard to follow. <laughs> Y'all have all been awesome. So thank you so much for just allowing me. I broke your first norm. I came in late. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but I'm, sure. good. I'm so sorry. Uh, but just to appreciate everything that you've done. This is a hard process. And I understand that not everybody understands it until you go through it. It's it's hard to capture and it's hard to articulate to someone who's not lived through this process how hard it is, but it is truly changing the way we do education because if you, those, you know, we remember how we went to school and what it was like and it was a, a, a factory model. I mean, we taught it. We hope that they got it and then they went on to the next class. If they didn't get it, they didn't get it. And I remember we had A class, B class, C class, D class, and you didn't want to be in D class and everybody knew who was in D class, but you were sentenced to the D class. I mean, you were in D class the next year. You were in D class and someone said it best when we were talking, and they said, this is not uh, changing the lives of students. It's really saving the lives of students. Because now we're looking at the students and we're focused on student learning, and it's not about us getting the, the standards taught. It's not about going from page one to 367, and we tell the State Department, yes, I taught all of your standards. It's about the learning of that student. Because school, and we all know this too, is not the way it used to be. Our students are not raised in the same way we were raised. The other day we were having a conversation at my, in my house and uh, my kids, I have a 25-year-old and twins who are 21. And I said, you know, what are they going to tell their kids about how it was different? Because we were talking about party lines. You remember when you had the party lines? <laughs> and someone else is on the other phone. And, you know, I can remember when gas was this much and I can remember this. And I thought, what are they going to tell their kids if they remember? You know, I can remember when cell phones came in the picture. Well, now they're walking around. I can remember when the encyclopedia salesman showed up at the door. And now they're walking around with the encyclopedia in Google in their hands 24-7. And it, even last night as we were watching American Idol, I was Googling, who did this, who did this? And it's, I'm, the, finger, the answers are right here at my fingertips. But how do we reach those kids who are in a different learning environment? And this is the way to do it. 
I mean, it's so wet because now you know your kids. Kids like kids and skill by skill. It's so impressive and it's hard work. And that is, it's hard to tell someone they're changing lives because they know where that child is and they've developed this growth mindset. So when you walk into that child, the, the, to the child, you say, hey, tell me what you're doing in RTI. Well, I, I move out of here when I learn about, I don't even know what you're talking about. Smiles. Smiles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about it. So I'm not going to be the one that takes them. But they know they've developed that growth mindset. But it truly is a belief. And it's something that we're, we're changing the system. But you've got to believe that all kids can learn. And do you believe it? And, and I asked, I had a conversation with yesterday with the superintendent and he said, well, you know, it's, I can't even remember how you worded it. And I said, can you tell those parents of those 20% that you don't believe that they're going to learn it, that, hey, I know they're going through the education system, but they're not going to learn it. Do you want to make that call and tell that parent that? And, no, no, you know, that's not. So we believe all kids can learn. How do we get this across the state? And I will promise you, and that's because I'm in two different roles. When I came into the state of Arkansas and we started working with this, I came in as a project school. And I can remember that first year and the 50 day, days that you got that first year. And you went, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. You know, I didn't realize what I signed up for. And then I now see it from the state level too. And I'm going, how do we align everything so that we're not going against this process? And so we are working hard to do that. But we're also looking to you to help us do that because no longer is it the state's doing this to you, but the state is doing this with you. So you've got to say, hey, this is not what's best for kids. And you gotta pick up the call and call me call us because we listen to you. We have that statewide guiding coalition that we're always talking about, hey, what barriers are we putting in place that you cannot assure ensure high levels of learning for your students? So I just wanted to share and I wanted to promise you where we are with this. This is not a new shiny ball that we're chasing. It's my job to help sustain this. So as you do it, get into the next year and you go, okay, well, we don't have our coaches. What do we do? We hit this barrier. You pick up the phone and call and I go, I'm on it. We'll figure it out. We're going to find someone to help remove that barrier. That's my promise to you. My other promise, and I want you just to know some of the things and conversations that are happening in the State Department. We are working with higher ed institutions. There are 19 in the state that have uh, teacher prep programs. How do we get teachers ready for this? Because we all know in education, we weren't trained this way. We were not trained. We were trained to teach the standards. We were trained to come in. We knew when we were coming in and being evaluated, and that's what we were looking for. And when they came in, they said, were well, the students engaged? It was more whether or not the teacher was engaged and standing up and doing something versus whether or not the students were learning. But now we're focused on learning. So how do we get our ed prep students? And there's a lot of different learning theories about professional learning communities. So you have someone coming in who wants to, who wants to share this other idea with you. And really, their idea of professional learning communities is bringing a problem or practice to the table and you solve that problem. Where this is an ongoing process. I mean, it never stops. We never get there. You get a next group of students and you go, hey, I've got to tweak, tweak these units. I've got to tweak this. You never get there. Yeah, it's hard work, but our kids deserve it. Every kid in Arkansas deserves this. So we're, we've got that commitment. Higher ed, uh, just some other things, just beginning amen, administrator training. How's that going to look different? Because now as a principal, we know our leader in the school and you're building the capacity of the teachers, we know that there's a teacher shortage. And you can't evaluate them out of it. You have to pull up a chair and support them. So how do we prepare our beginning administrators and our administrators to understand what is an essential standard and how do you unpack it? And when this new teacher comes in, instead of saying, okay, they didn't pass the evaluation, how do you pull up a chair and say, let me show you how to identify an essential standard and let me show you how to unpack it and how to look at the data at that school. Uh, our GT program, they're looking at what do you do with question four and how do we answer question four, which is going to be a different way that we look at things in that. Especially, I know you've heard of inclusive practices and ensuring all kids learn that they're in that core content. Standards-based grading, we're not there. This is going to take us years, but I'm going to tell you that we're working on it. How do you get standards-based into eSchool? So that you're not doing, doing two different documents. We were working on that. That's not going to be easy. Uh, but your school improvement plans, 
Um, how does that look so that it works with the process and you're not turning in a document here and there? HQIM. So many of you have heard, hey, we've got these high quality instruction materials. What is the state doing? You know, they, they're over here, they're asking PLC to identify essential standards. And over here, they've got high quality instructional materials. And we're supposed to follow that with fidelity? No, that is not what the state is saying. So, and I even went to learning services and I said, what are y'all doing? What are you doing? I mean, because my job is to protect this and help sustain. What are we doing? And I said, oh, that's not. And so we made sure that we put in there the, the clarity around fidelity. When we say fidelity, it does not mean to start on page one and go to 367 or whatever on your high quality. It means I've identified my essential standards. And with fidelity, we're using this high quality instruction material as our number one resource. It may not have all of the resources, so I may have to go somewhere else. But with Fidelity, we committed to this resource because someone has gone through those resources and they've made sure that the rigor is aligned to the standards of the state. So that's where that is. So I want to make sure that you've I've cleared up that mis misconception because I've heard it over and over again. When you start hearing those misconceptions, please call me because I want to make sure that I can help in taking it away at the state level because you're doing the right work. Your students are receiving something that every student in the state of Arkansas should receive. And I want to help you get there, and I want to help remove every barrier possible. So on behalf of Secretary Key and Dr. Pepper and Stacey Smith, I apologize if they could be here. They had an education committee meeting this morning, or they would have been here. This is their favorite time is to go and celebrate with the other cohort schools. But thank you for having me. Uh, next time I visit, I will be on time, I promise. <laughs> uh, thank y'all. Y'all got a great place. Lots going on. It's me. I've already closed. Close. It says on the board. Look. Yeah, look. Close. It, it was in the book. Did I not do a wonderful closing? <laughs> yes. 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 This is the norm, folks. <laughs> I love most of y'all. <laughs> No, again, John, I don't know how much we can say thank you enough. To, you know, it's one of those situations, and uh, Kim, same thing. Um, this has been a process, I know, for you guys as well. And it's amazing when you look at the, the video and you, you hear the testimonies that you've heard. And I, I made reference to it earlier at the very beginning. We just had some obstacles to go through. When you look at that, you didn't know there was any obstacles. I got the greatest faculty, again, greatest student, the greatest administrator, and the greatest community. And that's why we are who we are. Awesome. Here, I'm going to bail you out. In the words of Winnie the Pooh, a paraphrase of Winnie the Pooh, because I can't remember. And it's something very good that makes saying goodbye so very hard. That's what Winnie the Pooh would have said. So, we do thank you. We thank all of our guests for coming today, too. It's past the boss. The boss gets grouchy after lunchtime. I eat dinner at 11 o'clock. I'm an old guy that dinner used to be 11 and supper was at 